Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Peace, blessings and mercy be upon you all. Welcome back to my page. In the video today, we are going to be exploring who God is and what the three major Abrahamic faiths believe God is like and why. While this video in the series will focus on the inherent similarities between the God of the Jews, the God of the Christians, and the God of the Muslims, the next video in the series will in turn unpack and investigate why the Trinitarian notion, which has become popular in contemporary Christianity, veers away from the strictly Unitarian traditions of Judaism, Islam, and even early Christianity. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. First, Let's meet God as described in the Torah, the Bible, and the Quran. Just like there are various branches of Christianity, for example, Episcopalian, Charismatic, Dutch Reformed, etc., there are various different branches or traditions within both Judaism and even Islam. What we need to remember at all times is that these deviations are man-made inventions, distinctions drawn after the relevant revelations, and not decreed by God, in any of the three major Abrahamic faiths. It is not God who decided that faith be practiced according to one of the following X number of streams. Man came and segregated the broader religious community into those who thought like one another and essentially formed cliques. So, it is our responsibility in seeking God to look beyond the man-made divisions at all levels and to return to the source text to establish what it is that the different factions can agree upon. And what is truth according to God, untainted by the temptations and tendencies of man to want to categorize, organize and draw distinctions between what he perceives to be different, one from another. Where I'm going with this is simple. There are many ways or streams of practicing Judaism. For example, Hasidic Judaism, Orthodox Judaism, Conservative Judaism, etc. All these different self-categorizations applied by those who practice the faith do not undermine the essential quality of the identity of God as one, as singular, as wholly deserving of worship. Though the different sects may differ in other matters, the Jewish understanding of God as one is, to quote Dr. Lawrence B. Brown, relatively concrete. Throughout Judaism, the oneness of God remains the primary attribute of the Creator, followed by many others, including justice, love, mercy, omniscience, omnipresence, omnipotence, sovereignty, truth, wisdom, self-existence, goodness, holiness, eternity, and the even trickier concept of infinity. Furthermore, Jews consider God fundamentally incomprehensible, for God's attributes transcend those of his creation. In other words, Jews believe that we have been created as subservient and subordinate to the mighty creator and can, as a result, not comprehend the true nature of God, for it surpasses the limits of our worldly understanding. It is, then, our duty to stand in awe of a God so much greater than ourselves that he defies complete comprehension or experience within the confines of our own physical world. A number of these same attributes carry over to the, especially early, Christian conception or understanding of God. While early Christians remained fundamentally Unitarian, as encouraged by Jesus Christ himself, it was only in later years that the so-called mysticism of the Trinity took root, and so transfigured the popular conception of God in the Christian faith. Trying to decipher the concept of a God who is three but one baffles the mind, especially when you consider that the three who are supposed to make up the one are fundamentally and characteristically incompatible with one another. To use a simple example, if God is accepted by Jews, Christians both early and contemporary, and Muslims alike, to be without beginning and without end, how could a mortal man be equal to, or a part of, an eternal God? If God is fundamentally immortal, he cannot also be mortal, can he? It's a logical paradox. As in our previous series, Son of God, I find it best to look to what Jesus himself had to say about his own identity in this case, that he had no divinity of his own. If Jesus was part of the divine, or a partner in divinity, then his statement would be fundamentally untrue, would it not? So, essentially, you're left with another logical paradox. If Jesus is part of a triune God, he must have his own claim to divinity. But, if he is a part of a triune God, 
He must also be, as God and his wisdom are declared to be in the New Century Version's translation of James chapter 3 verse 17, fair and honest, or more to the point, the wisdom that comes from heaven does not pretend to be what it is not. So, if Jesus is part of God and his infinite wisdom, he cannot pretend to be what he is not. In other words, if Jesus is part of a triune God, he must be both truthful and divine. But according to the man himself, he has no claim to divinity. For references, please see below. Which begs the question, is Jesus honest or is he divine? And how can he be considered godly if, as is evinced by his own statement, he cannot be both? This may seem confusing at first, and that's because it is. In order to accept that Jesus is part of a triune God, one must blatantly defy the assertion made in Titus chapter 1 verse 2, that God never lies. But we'll further explore how the concept of the Trinity came to be, and how it compares and contrasts with the beliefs of the other Abrahamic faiths, and even its own early practitioners' beliefs, in part 2 of this video series. For now, suffice it to say that the Trinitarian concept of God flies in the face of the conception of God as one in the majority of the Abrahamic faiths, that is to say, in Judaism and Islam. So, who is God in Islam? In Islam, God is he who has power over all things, he who encompasses all things in his knowledge, the one to whom belongs whatever is in the heavens and whatever is on the earth for he is ever self-sufficient and praiseworthy. God is thus fundamentally conceived of as all-knowing, all-powerful and self-sufficient. Anything or anyone who does not meet these three primary criteria can thus be discounted from any claim to divinity, which makes sense, as we know God is without equal. While Muslims thus accept and even celebrate Jesus' peace and blessings be upon him as a messenger of God, we do not believe that Jesus can be God for the simple reason that he is not all-knowing, he is not all-powerful, and he was not self-sufficient. Make sense? Ultimately, then, the Jewish, early Unitarian Christian and Islamic conceptions of God have far more in common than contemporary mainstream media would have you believe. However, if you'd still like to know more about how contemporary Trinitarian Christianity compares and contrasts with the conception of God in Judaism and Islam, I encourage you to subscribe to my page and to my YouTube channel and turn on the post notification that you can be alerted as soon as I publish part 2 of this video series, which will explore the history and paradoxical nature of the concept of the Trinity in more detail. Until then, as always. If you have any questions about any of the content I've shared with you today, please feel free to contact me via my page and I'd be more than happy to share some additional resources with you. Alternatively, I'm always happy to engage in constructive and mutually respectful conversation in the comment section or in my DMs. Until next time, Zakalakher.